you know, since the Bitcoin ETFs launch, we've seen a lot of organic net longs enter those ETFs. Uh, there's no question about that. We haven't really changed our price target around 550 by year end. We still think that it has another leg up this year. It does seem to me that sentiment is is rather poor right now. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome into another edition of Coinage as we uh, take a look at the market action as Bitcoin is back north above 62,000 right now per coin. It was a little bit of a quiet weekend. Historically, quiet volumes and soft and trading over the weekend, so not too much to report, which is good because it is, of course, a shortened week when it comes to traditional markets with the 4th of July uh, coming up on Thursday. So there are still, you know, for a short week, still big headlines to watch, whether it's traditional macro drivers around manufacturing numbers and Fed Chair Jay Powell speaking. Uh, still things to watch there. Before we get into the thrust of the show, though, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our sponsor on today's episode in Mezzo, as we've been highlighting for the better part of a few weeks, Mezzo is a new home for Bitcoin holders to cultivate Bitcoin and grow wealth together. You can use your Bitcoin on Mezzo to unlock real utility and honest yield. Join Bitcoin's first open source economic layer today at Mezzo. And as we move ahead this week, I do think it is going to be pretty interesting to listen to what Jay Powell has to say. But of course, we don't just always listen to traditional markets here. We also dig into the nitty gritty. And there is a lot going on on the Bitcoin and Ether fronts, perhaps unsurprisingly. Luckily, good news is the Bitcoin ETFs have been stemming the outflows when we dig into the data from CoinShares. Interesting to see some of this. Uh, if you want to call this basically good setup for the ETH ETFs launch, which probably not going to happen this week, most likely to come after the 4th of July break as we look at kind of the filings that have to go through the process. I do want to highlight this numbers, the, the charts that we're seeing from CoinShares when it comes to weekly flows. And after two big moves, two big weeks in the negative, we are seeing basically just barely in the negative over the last week. So outflows from the Bitcoin ETFs, uh, you know, stemming the tide, taking a gut punch over the last couple of weeks and now essentially kind of break even when you add everything up. Of course, Bitcoin ETF flows are the largest piece of where the general crypto asset flows go when it comes to institutional products. Not always going to be the case, though, if we get ETH ETFs trading next week, those numbers will now increasingly be influenced by what happens to Ether. And it's worth noting in the latest week of uh, what CoinShares looked at, Ethereum actually saw the largest outflow since August 2022, totaling $61 million. So the last two weeks of outflows when it comes to ETH, 100 and, uh, 119 million, call it 120, making it the worst performing asset year to date in terms of net flows. So that's just generally what's been going on on the ETH front. And that actually could bode well. We're going to get into these expectations around what to see when ETH ETFs begin trading. Sean Farrell's got a number out there. We're going to get to him. He's the analyst at Fundstrat that nailed Bitcoin's price when he predicted that last year and so far has been pretty accurate in his prediction this year. So exciting to have him on the show. He'll join us in about 10 minutes or so to talk through where the market's at when it comes to expectations and why he actually thinks they are short of what we're going to see in the first five months of trading. This number is closer to $5 billion. We'll see how that compares and why he has such high expectations, given the fact that we just highlighted Ethereum trading has been relatively weak when it comes to existing institutional products heading into those ETH ETFs. Could be the fact that we saw uh, ahead of the Bitcoin ETFs, a lot of people basically shifting money around, getting ready for playing those vehicles rather than vehicles that already exist. Of course, some of those vehicles around the globe have existed. But when it comes to the U.S., as we saw with the Bitcoin ETFs, things change rather quickly, just given the size. Uh, I'm going to save what we heard from James Seyfert, of course. He was just on the show talking about his predictions. Texas. We'll play that later when we get to Sean Farrell. Don't want to play it twice in such quick, repetitive fashion. Um, but that's what we're seeing there, at least when we look backwards. Now, let's look forward and talk about the ETH ETF timeline because it was the case that I think a lot of people were expecting these things to come out this week. Of course, you never really know how long it's going to take when the SEC is going through all of these different you know, filings, going back and forth with issuers. We saw it with the Bitcoin ETFs as well. 
There's just a lot to get right. And if the SEC doesn't have to move as quick as they want to, they're most likely not going to. Uh, this tweet I have up, Texas from Eric Balchunas, one of the Bitcoin uh, ETF analysts, sorry, Bloomberg ETF analysts, um, was basically moving past his timeline from this week, of course, as a lot of people expected, to now post July 8th is what a lot of people are expecting to see as the, um, as the launch date for those um and you know again it's not a matter of basically when these things start trading it's a matter of if and we already solved that one uh there we go uh and so you know is it a little bit delayed sure but does that matter in the grand scheme of things no i think the bigger number that's going to matter is exactly how many of these things how much money flows into these vehicles not when we see them and honestly to be honest most people are out this week because it's a short week anyways so you don't want it to start on a Friday and no one pays attention to it. You want to see it next week. So I don't think that that's a big deal, but we are going to get into, as I said, Sean Farrell's expectations around that. Of course, you got all these issuers, the fees on these things. People didn't really know where the fees were going to land. And it's actually looking like the fees are going to be quite low. So, you know, you thought the Bitcoin ETF fees were low. ETH ETF, I think I saw one from Franklin Templeton around like 0.19%. So these are like pretty low fee vehicles. Um, you got to think that that might help um, everyone except for Grayscale. And that's going to be another key piece of, of Sean Farrell's uh, predictions is actually lower outflows in Grayscale's existing products relative to what we saw in outflows from the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. All those things do matter because that is included in the net outflows or the net flow number in total. So um, an interesting setup as well. But anyways, taking longer than expected, not the end of the world. Everybody keep your pants on, especially on a short week uh, as we move ahead. There is also another thing to talk about around institutional activity. This is something that, you know, kind of has weirdly not been talked about all that much this year as all the attention has been on ETFs, because if you're an institutional investor, you might just want to really access crypto exposure by just scooping up and holding a Bitcoin ETF. You don't have to worry about custody. You don't have to worry about any of that. But interestingly, uh, when we think about what's being left on the table when it comes to ETH ETFs, there's not staking involved with that. Keep that in mind. So with the Bitcoin ETF, those products in terms of Bitcoin staking earning yield on your Bitcoin holdings really only kind of making its way to the forefront when it comes to institutional investors. You know, if you natively handle your Bitcoin, you might know about stacks. You might know about some of these other opportunities. But for a lot of people, it's just easier. Buy the shares in a BlackRock ETF or Bitcoin. You don't have to worry about it. But Abra is now out with some interesting tools to help uh, people who are looking to dip a toe in crypto, perhaps more than a toe in crypto. And that is worth highlighting today because I think it does matter when it comes to onboarding family offices, uh, nonprofits, companies in the way that maybe, you know, they want to do this, but don't have the huevos that Michael Saylor does to really plunge so much of their treasury into these assets. They need some help. And Abra is out uh, with new tools for companies to do just that, hopefully making it easier on them. It's an interesting company, Texas. I mean, when we talk about what Abra is all about, you know, kind of came from the same ilk. They've been around for a long time. Uh, I think I was actually on uh, one interview with them and Celsius, his former CEO, Alex Mashinsky. And it's interesting to think about all those lenders, BlockFi, Celsius, ones that went down in the last cycle. And Abra basically sitting there as one of those, you know, platforms, companies that are trying to help onboard people, just sitting there now and looking at, you know, the possibilities to become one of the adults in the room when it comes to helping companies that are more Web2 get involved in Web3. Anyways, we did chat with Abra CEO Bill Barheit about this just a few weeks ago and digging into why uh, what Abra offers to the market is so important. And as a registered investment advisor, why that also gives them a leg up on the competition and what he's seeing now as we move forward in the rest of this bullish cycle. Take a listen to what Bill told us just a couple weeks ago. We're seeing a lot of corporate interest from institutional treasury in using the RIA model to earn a safe yield. Mm -hmm. Not only a safe yield on dollars, but even to get exposure to Bitcoin and potentially even earn yield on the Bitcoin. And that's new. We didn't see that, to the, at least to the degree we're seeing it now, mm -hmm. in the past. 
And I think the ETF, to your point, has been great marketing vehicle for this. Because, uh, you know, the stocks trade, what, 35 hours a week? Yep. Bitcoin trades 144 hours a week. There are other protocols besides Bitcoin. Um, dollars use, you know, stable coins, but mostly use Ethereum and now Solana and Polygon, I guess. And, and so, you know, there's tremendous interest, not only in Bitcoin, but in other things. And the model we've created makes it tenable for high net worth investors, family offices, and institutions to access, you know, our model. So now they got uh, Abra Treasury, which is going to be the service to let corporates hold crypto if they want on their balance sheet as a reserve asset. I think that's another thing that's really put on the back burner when it comes to stories that we should be watching in 2023, just kind of given what MicroStrategy has done and what other companies looking at that surge are saying, probably in their own boardrooms now being like, hey, should we be doing this too? And what are the what are the options to turn to to maybe make this easier on us? Now, Aber Treasury exists, going to be operated by, again, an SEC registered investment advisor, compliant company here, uh, providing these tools. So I think it's an important thing to highlight. And again, shout out to Bill for sitting down with us uh, when we were out there at Token 2049 in Dubai. Uh, it was an interesting chat because I do think they're now in a prime position with a lot of these companies not around anymore. Uh, and if you've weathered the storm, generally on the other side, you're looked at as more responsible and the adult in the room. So I think it's it's pretty interesting because we'll see what more companies want to build off of not just MicroStrategy, but also what uh, Jack Dorsey has been doing at Block. Um, I think there's a lot of now resources where you're not just kind of figuring it out. You can put someone, maybe even one or two people on a team if you're at a company trying to move in the Web3 direction and really not have to go it alone and make the mistakes that a lot of people who have come before have. So I think it's interesting. Shifting aside though, another big uh, interesting read. We don't highlight a lot of interesting reads on the Monday show so much, but I do think since it was something we talked about last week, it's actually quite interesting to see all of the VCs now uh, coming together on one coin, really all of them backing. And this could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, honestly, when we back one coin or when you see a lot of VCs tripping over each other to maybe get exposure to one coin. But that one coin is Ton. We talked about it last week's uh, on last week's show and kind of interesting to always think about where these VCs are getting in. Um, Texas, I don't know if you can see my screen now. I, I know we've been trying to figure this out today. That's a no. That's a no. OK, well, I'll try and refresh it over here. But Ton is up 450 percent in the last year. So it's perhaps maybe worked out well for these VCs who have tried to put some money into it. And I think as we continue to see more VCs plow more money into Ton, as well as more games and more users being drawn to Ton, I think that it's interesting to maybe think about, is this a good bet to follow or is it not? You can see it now. All right, here's the chart. We were talking about Ton being up more than 400%. I'm not lying here. It is. You can take a look at the chart and realize it for yourself. It's been a hell of a year. And also, this is the story that we're talking about from the block. So many VCs now bullish on the Ton token. And it's really not just Pantera. We talked about that as one of uh, you know the big VCs that is now saying it's their largest investment ever. This article lists Kingsway Capital as also making the move to make it their biggest token holding to date. Um, and formerly Sino Global Capital, Rise Labs, also heavily invested in the Ton token. And a lot of these firms getting in, as well as Animoca Brands, at $1, $1.50 and at $2. And as I, as I just showed you, it's now at $7.62. So anytime you got VCs that far in the profit, just saying, you know, Take a look at the lockup. Take a look at when these tokens can be sold because it's all important. And as always, take a look at the actual fundamentals behind some of these things as well. Uh, Want to play a little bit of what we heard from Dragonfly's GP, Rob Haddock, last week on the show, talking about whether or not these VCs and really the valuation around Ton, Telegram's chosen token, is getting a little bit ahead of itself. Take a listen to what Rob told us. I wrote down a couple stats here. Um, it's the sixth biggest blockchain by uh, FDV, uh, mm -hmm. but if and it's the ninth biggest crypto asset by um, uh, if you uh, include the stable coins as well. But when you look at like the other stats of what's happening from a total value locked perspective, it's the 14th biggest blockchain. From a transactions perspective, it's the 21st. From applications built on on top of the Tom blockchain today, it's 58th. From developer commits, it's 60th. 
Uh, so you start to look at all of these these different stats and you say, okay, well, I can see the story of why Ton should be uh, able to bring all of these net new users and I want to buy into that, I believe that. But if, if that's true, uh, we haven't yet seen that adoption. We haven't yet seen those applications, those builders being there uh, that are going to bring in uh, those users. And so that's the question I think you have to ask right now uh, on a relative value basis. On a relative value basis, that's one of the big questions. Every time we talk about, uh, you know, wallets, active wallets, if they really correspond to real people, and particularly when it comes to all the action right now on Ton, I do think it is interesting to think about tapped games, as in, you know, just tapping constantly. Um, and I think, I don't know how real the users are when it comes to tapping on your phone to earn coins. Obviously, short-term incentives, we've seen those go poorly in the gaming space before. Uh, just go ahead and take a look at some of the other projects that have boomed and busted in the crypto space. Um, something to be careful of in gaming. But certainly, again, nothing new here when it comes to users. I think the big thing that is unique to uh, Telegram and Toncoin, of course, is this idea of abstracting away the idea of users actually knowing that it's crypto. And Telegram being a huge Web2 platform with millions of users, not so hard to see a world where they can put it on the back end and make it super easy to onboard all these users. So another interesting uh, story to flag when it comes to VCs, not just Pantera now, uh, not just formerly Sino Global, but Animoca Brands and others really coalescing around Ton being the darling to watch. Just keep your eyes on that one. I think it's pretty fascinating uh, to watch whether retail follows in that bet as well. Nonetheless, the big thing that we are talking about, as always, is the ETH ETF with it on the docket. Maybe not for this week, but perhaps next. And I want to bring on uh, a guest that is near and dear to the show here, as well as a Coinage member, uh, has been right more often than probably any guest that we've had on the show. Uh, Sean Farrell, Fundstrat's head of global, uh, or Fundstrat Global's head of digital asset research. Sean joins us now. Sean, it's good to see you, man. Zach, great to, great to see you too. I don't, I don't know if I'm coming in. Am I echoing right now? Oh, no, you're not echoing. You sound good to me. No, all right, on my great. Side. All good. All um, good. Um, yeah, no, man, it's good to see you. I think, I think as we've seen before, these ETFs are always exciting because uh, the market's all over the place. And your guys' expectation, I want to highlight, unless it's changed since I saw your note, $5 billion is the expectation for inflows around ETH ETFs. If I had to put a headline on how I put your research into where everyone is, it would be the market is underestimating the impact that is about to come from the ETH ETFs. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. And if you want me to just run through our... our um kind of how we're seeing things right now. I think there are three very different aspects of the ETH ETF launch as compared to the Bitcoin ETF launch. Um, you know, one, and most importantly, in my opinion, is the macro setup. I think if you look at a chart of the dollar and rate expectations via Fed funds futures and plot on the chart, you know, in the, in the year to date chart, uh, you know, where the Bitcoin ETF launched and where the ETH ETF is expected to launch, uh, you know, at least in our opinion, from a macro perspective, it does seem like right now uh, the path of least resistance for the dollar is lower. <clears throat> it does seem like rate expectations uh, are likely to get priced back in. I mean, we're seeing all um, you know, all the recent data that's come out uh, from a uh, macro perspective has been pointing to inflation con continuing to fall. Uh, you know, we had a 2.6 core PC last week. Uh, we had, you know, prices paid in the ISM reading today uh, come in much, much lower than expectations. So that's great. We're also seeing soft, softening the job market. And so, um, you know, it does seem like as compared to back in January, when we were just on the precipice of actually a huge repricing higher of the dollar uh, and a pricing out of rate cuts, uh, it's a complete opposite right now. Um, in addition to that, you know, trader sentiment, you know, there's, this is a tougher one to quantify, but you know, you just talk to anybody in the, in the industry right now or just go on social media. I don't know if that's the best barometer, but it does seem to me that sentiment is is rather poor right now. Um, and then the third component is that, you know, I think a lot of people are, you know, superimposing the, for good reason, superimposing the Bitcoin launch on top of the ETH launch and uh, are expecting a lot of outflows from ETHE, uh, it's a Grayscale product. And, uh, you know, it's our intuition that that likely surprises to the downside in terms of outflows. Um, you know, and, and there are two reasons for that. One, 
being there is much less buyer estimations, much less uh, ETHE held in bankruptcy estates. So for um, the, the Bitcoin ETF launch for, for GBTC rather, uh, there was you know upwards of uh, one billion of GBTC redeemed in the first week post launch from FTX. Uh, best estimates for the amount of ETHE locked in that FTX bankruptcy is around uh, 200 million, so about 20 percent. But there's actually a good chance that's that's already been liquidated by the estate because earlier this year uh, there was actually a it was actually consensus that the ETH ETF would not launch. So perhaps they took advantage of the um, you know, the liquidity in Q1 to, to actually unload that. And two, if you look at the latest commitment of traders reports report on the CME, um, there's about, uh, you, you know, you can section, you can um, segment the different positions on the CME, CME futures based on, you know, the type of trader uh, market participant that person is and whether they're long or short. And if you just compare hedge fund short interests on the CME, ahead of the Bitcoin ETF launch. It was about five times the amount of uh, short interest for hedge funds uh, on the CME ahead of the ETH launch for ETH futures, of course. And so, you know, again, that's about uh, 20%, 20% of the amount. And that's a good proxy for, in our opinion, how much, you know, ARB trading and, and um, you know, unwinding of that ARB trade we're going to see. Obviously, Wall Street's far more evolved, far, far more evolved than where crypto markets are. And the idea of, you know, research reports at a lot of the big banks, a lot of the big players, you can kind of start to see where expectations are, perhaps more reliably so than maybe, as you said, just going around Twitter and trying to get a polling of, of where people are at. But I do think, you know, from the numbers that I've seen, it does seem like they might be close to where you are. So when we talk about surprise to the upside, I'm kind of curious to, to see whether or not that could be the case. We've heard from Bitwise CIO Matt Hogan and his kind of idea of $15 billion in the first 18 months. That would put them pretty close to, I think, what we've seen also um, from other uh, predictions, including Galaxy Digital saying... It'd probably be between three and seven point five billion. And I mentioned the the Bloomberg ETF analysts. We heard from James Seyfert on the show just a couple of weeks ago. I want to play where he was at because even he and Eric Balchunas, the other Bloomberg intelligence ETF expert, they're kind of breaking too around fifteen to twenty to twenty five percent. Here's what James told us. Take a listen, and then I'll get your reaction on the other side. So right now we're looking at fifteen point six billion have come into these Bitcoin ETFs since they launched in January. So it's about mm -hmm. almost exactly five months actually. If you get 25% of that, that is a massive, massive launch and success for a new ETF category, like would be the second most successful launch, um, basically, uh, for, for an ETF category in history. So, I mean, even even the numbers we're talking about and thinking about, um, even if they're lower than we're expecting, it's there's, there's there's still chance for this thing to be absolutely massive as far as ETF launches go. Now, Sean, I guess the important thing to note is that, of course, you're smart. James is smart. Eric's smart. Everyone's kind of deep in the sauce when it comes to crypto analysts. But the big gap, I think, is the institutional, maybe big names that aren't deep in the sauce. And they might be surprised by the number you're throwing out, $5 billion. So is that kind of the way that people should be thinking about it? Yeah. And look, if, if I, I think the, the benchmark that a lot of people are using are... are you know, market cap weight or slightly below that. And that's kind of how we also uh, estimated our inflows. But I guess just to be a little more precise is in terms of how this could play out and how uh, the ETF in and of itself could generate demand and additional flows. So we've seen, uh, you know, since the Bitcoin ETFs launch, we've seen a lot of organic net longs enter those ETFs. Uh, there's no question about that. But we've also seen a pretty good deal of inflows being generated by uh, funds that are are trading the the basis, They're, are putting on the basis trade, right? So mm -hmm. you short futures, uh, you long, um, you long Bitcoin via the ETF, um, and you have a risk managed way of generating pretty solid annualized returns. Um, I think what could happen is if we get the dollar rolling over, if we get the, the macro tailwinds that we expect to get, um, in addition to outflows as surprise to the downside, I think that could kickstart some speculation across you know all liquidity sensitive assets, particularly ETH, because if people see that you know ETH outflows are um, a lot more muted than they were expecting, ETHE outflows that is, 
Um, I think people are going to be inclined to speculate more. That's that'll increase the basis, bring some flows in to to arb that basis, and uh, you know that in and of itself can beget additional flows. And I think that's kind of how you can get to that five billion in the first five billion of inflows in the first five months rather um, rather easily. Yeah, it has been interesting. And again, obviously, we've seen some ups and downs. But in general, when you think about where we started the year, at least in Bitcoin, the general takeaway has been inflows have surpassed anyone's expectations. And that's led to positive price run for Bitcoin, probably expecting based on what your predictions are about to see the same playbook run back for Ethereum next week. Um, When it comes to what the impact of those are, on the rest of the ecosystem, I'm curious to get your take then if we do see positive moves in the same way we saw it for Bitcoin, what that means for, I don't know, the likes of two of your favorite projects or at least projects that we've asked you about in the past, one being Solana first, and then maybe one being the Bitcoin adjacent projects like Stacks. Uh, and if those are maybe the ancillary ones to watch, if we do see this ETH ETF go well. Uh, yeah, so I mean, just commenting on Solana, I mean, we, we haven't really changed our price target around 550 by year end. We still think that it has another leg up this year. And, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a smaller asset than ETH, so it, it requires less inflows to move it higher. Uh, but I think what's also important to understand is that we have an election coming up um, in November, and there is a lot of momentum behind the party that is oriented around, um, you know, creating a more sound regulatory framework for crypto, uh, meaning, you know, um, just creating, you know, passing actual laws to regulate this this space via Congress and not regulating through enforcement. Um, And there's going to be a lot of tailwinds for crypto due to that and a lot of tailwinds for getting additional products, uh, exchange traded products listed in the U.S. And I think it's been clear, you know, we had Van Eck and, and uh, 21 shares, um, you know, you know, file to issue a, a Solana ETF. Uh, I, I'm not, we're not bullish on the prospects of that actually uh, happening, uh, but it will get the conversation moving on the launch of CME futures for Solana, because I think before you have a Solana ETF, uh, you have to get CME futures. And so uh, while, while there's no ETF to speculate on or to source inflows from, there will certainly be a repricing, at least in our opinion, a repricing higher for Solana due to uh, other product related tailwinds that might come come down the road, uh, you know, uh, through the the rest of this year. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's interesting. And obviously, you know, you mentioned kind of the, the uh, CME futures around Solana. Obviously, those don't exist and they were a big part of why we saw Bitcoin ETFs and ETH ETFs approved. Um, we're going to have SEC Commissioner Hester Purse on in a couple of weeks, as we often do on the show. She's coming back after the 4th of July break. I don't Great. know why, but it's always, it's always around the 4th of July that she comes on the show. A very patriotic coinage. She, she's, um, a, she's a great patriot. So She is a great patriot. One of our favorites at the SEC, of course. And when we think about, uh, you know, whether or not you need CME futures, it was interesting to hear Van X. um uh, team talking about whether or not that actually is the case or if there's other ways to maybe... Uh, get to a Solana ETF approval without that. So we're going to be asking her about that. But uh, regardless, I think we're all in the same camp that no one's necessarily saying just because you file, you're going to get approved. It took a long time for both Bitcoin and ETH ETFs to get approved. But when it comes to stacks and maybe Bitcoin L2 adjacent type products, that's obviously been one that you've enjoyed uh, talking about that you've been bullish on in the past. Um, Curious if that's still kind of the the same way you're looking at them as Bitcoin has kind of, you know, not exactly been the most exciting summer, but everything else around it. I wonder if you're still in the same camp. Yeah, it's been a pretty boring summer, you know, for the, for the majors, frankly. Um, you probably would have been better off just signing off and going to the beach and, and coming back uh, <laughs> you know, now. But um, yeah, look, I, I think I think Saks and other Bitcoin adjacent assets, um, you know, there are a couple out there like Core and uh, Core Chain and, and a couple of... Um, uh, you know, L2 tokens that are expected to launch. I still think there's a lot of upside there, particularly if we break that 72K range. Um, you know, I'd expect them to still perform, uh, particularly Stacks as, as a very, um, you know, a good way to achieve beta to Bitcoin. Uh, obviously, there are also a lot of fundamental tailwinds for that ecosystem. They're undergoing their Nakamoto upgrade right now, which 
should bring more commerce uh, on chain uh, for the, for that platform. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, and uh, you know we should expect the same. You know, should ETH get the bid that we expect, we should also see. Um, you know, I think there are so many ETH adjacent assets. You probably have to be a little more selective. Um, you know, because you have all the L2 tokens, you have uh, you know things like Lido and other you know DeFi DeFi governance tokens. So you have to be more more um, selective around the ETH ETH beta that you choose. You know, we do, and actually, despite the SEC's actions, we still like Lido here. It's just a fundamentally um, used product in the space, um, and uh, you know, to date, you know, the, the SEC has labeled a lot of different tokens as securities, and that hasn't necessarily affected performance. So I think that's probably worth worth fading. And you know, we think so. We think you know, Lido will will would should catch a bid if if ETH does well. Uh, same thing with things like Maker. Um, L2s, there's a lot of fragment fragment of liquidity around those tokens, uh, so we're we're gonna assess which ones are, are are you know have the most steam and have the strongest bid behind them, but yeah. certainly those those should do well as well. Yeah, I, I definitely hear you on the fragmentation. It's almost it's it's become incredibly difficult to really track all the L2 stuff going on behind the scenes when you've got so many of them competing with each other. Um, but yeah. just to put a cap on it, when it comes to, I think, maybe where we're at in this market, right, relative to, I feel like every time we have you on, we talk to you relative to where you were at the beginning of the year, just to kind of challenge where things may have changed. And certainly now, as we are officially in the back half of 2024, I do wonder if there are any like key pieces that you think maybe, A, the market's sleeping on, which it sounds like the expectations for the ETH ETF certainly one of them, but also maybe B, where you've changed your mind relative to the beginning of the year. Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, have not necessarily changed my mind about anything. I think if anything, um, if anything, convictions are even stronger. Are you saying? Yeah. If anything, you know, I'm just I'm just uh, yeah. I've, I've gained a little more conviction that we're kind of uh, in the middle of a longer expansion in global liquidity and that we have a, you know, on a 12 to 18 month time horizon, we, we have a, a lot more ways to go. Uh, obviously not a straight line up. Um, you know, I do think we get north, of, see north of 100K this year. I do, if there's anything that any people are discounting, I, I do think people are discounting the um, amount of uh, bullishness that might be derived from uh, a Republican victory in November or and in the White House and or in Congress, because I do think if, you know, the Senate were to turn red, that would also be remarkably constructive for for the space. Um, you know, because obviously there's a higher likelihood of us pushing, you know, market structure bill forward, pushing stablecoin mm -hmm. legislation forward. Um, in addition, you know, we, we would also have likely have a new SEC chair. And so, um, you know, if anything, if anybody is discounting anything, it is probably that. Uh, but beyond that, no, I think I think we are, you know, are, we're, we're sticking to the script. Uh, you know, inflation is rolling over. Rates are coming down. Global global liquidity is uh, slowly but surely expanding. And um, yeah, in our view, we're we're going higher. Well, we will see all of that in the short term uh, play out, hopefully, to the tune that you've described and predicted. As I said off the top, your predictions normally locks when it comes to where we go in crypto. So appreciate you coming on, and we'll see what happens with the ETH ETFs supposedly after the 4th, and then we'll be able to ask SEC Commissioner Hester Purse about it. Uh, Sean Farrell, as always, love having you on, man. Thanks again for the time. We'll chat again soon. Thanks, Zach. Have a good one. I appreciate it, man. That'll do it for us on this edition of Coinage and the Monday Show. As always, you can recap all the top headlines as we watch them with the help of Web3's first ever community-owned show. People out there, RFT holders, flagging stories for us. I appreciate the help with us. You can head to coinage.media to check out all the big headlines and catch the recaps of all of our interviews always for free if you have an NFT. <laughs> Thanks to our partners at Mezzo, as always, for sponsoring Coinage. We'll see you again soon. Have a great day.